Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me here at Archerfield Airport. It's certainly a very historic building, and it is great to be here. So welcome to those who are inside the terminal here at Archerfield. Uh, welcome to those who are watching via Zoom live with us now, and welcome to anyone watching on YouTube long after I have left the earth. Um, I've been invited to give a talk on the history of media aviation in Brisbane and in Queensland. Um, and it's actually a topic that has never really been covered before. There are no books about it. Uh, there aren't websites about it. So um, this has been very interesting over the past couple of months, speaking to all the former pilots who used to fly for the networks uh, to build up that story. So um, this is sort of round one of kicking off the history of, of uh, media aviation in Queensland. In terms of who I am, um, I worked for Seven News for 30 years as a reporter, a producer, I uh, did Olympics, major events, uh, Brisbane floods, lots of things like that. Um, as a kid, I wanted to be a pilot, a helicopter pilot, and then decided instead I'd be a TV reporter who flew around in a helicopter pilot. So I certainly felt very uh, fortunate that I, I got to achieve my dream and, and fly around in the Seven News helicopter. I left Seven just over a year ago, and I now work for Brisbane Airport Corporation, and I'm their media manager. So um, I'm essentially telling aviation stories now on behalf of the airport. So that's who I am. Um, I'm gonna share a few short videos tonight just to help try and explain everything. So the first one is a quick background on who I am. It starts off with some of the aviation stories at Channel 7, and then some of the stories more recently at the airport. It's easy to tell the difference. The ones at Channel 7, I have hair. Um, the recent ones, I don't have hair. So let's have a look and see if the video plays. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you hear me? Okay, mate, uh, there's a great yard unfolding. Uh, we can go live as soon as you want. Unlike the Gold Coast, Sydney or Melbourne, Brisbane doesn't have a high-rise observation deck. Look out, Brisbane, here they come. Here they come, thanks, Pete. It is one of the most dangerous places on planet Earth to work. From the paddock to the plane and onto the plate, this produce will be in Hong Kong in just nine hours' time ready for lunch tomorrow. Reporter Peter Doherty is at Brisbane Airport. And Peter, do we know yet when the planes are likely to stop flying? Okay, the final flights will be Monday at midnight. Brisbane Airport, now owned by Brisbane Airport Corporation. $1.4 billion. It hopes to have a second runway within a decade. Peter Doherty, Seven Nightly News. Or they'll just speak one class. The first real service, 5.40, Monday morning from Roma Street. The sand must be left for three to four years to compact before the runway is laid on top. It was here Queensland put the queue into Qantas back in 1921. Right, Alan, it's all yours. Thank you. Yep. yep. They are Brisbane Airport's new airside safety vehicles, and yes, you just might need shades to look at them. This is the very first Brisbane to San Francisco flight. 22 tyres, no other commercial aircraft in the world even comes close. Have a look at this, it's probably the largest flying billboard on the planet. This aircraft is dripping in history. Well, this service will deliver thousands of tourists, Japanese tourists, into Queensland. Welcome to the 2023 Aviation Australia Aviation Expo. We are so lucky in Southeast Queensland to have not one, but two major airlines based here with Alliance and of course Virgin Australia, which also has its base right here in Brisbane. The first ever direct service from Vietnam to Queensland exactly 50 years ago. The very first jet from Fiji touched down at Brisbane Airport. 14 and a half thousand people through the international terminal today. The recovery is still happening in stages. So in the domestic terminal, we're back to around 90%. <laughs> What do you think of this? This is my sister. I 
How are you feeling now? Happy. Santa, what's your message? Oh, 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 oh. We're on the taxiway heading out to runway. Do that word again. Okay, we're recording. And that is just a sneak peek at some of the. Yeah. And that's just a look at some of the organisations here. Okay, we're good. Let's go. Whew. That's a quick introduction to who I am, my job back at Channel 7 and my job today. We're talking about media aviation and we're mainly talking about TV. So I just wanted to set the scene for the TV networks uh, in Brisbane um, because that'll be important for the story. So the first TV station in Brisbane was Channel 9 on August 16, 1959. 77 days later, Channel 7 was born. One day later after that, the ABC was born at studios down at Tuong. And then we had to wait a while for the fourth TV station to appear in Brisbane. In 1965, that was Channel O, where in other states around the country, it was called Channel 10. The reason for that was because Toowoomba already had a TV station using the Channel 10 frequency. So Channel 10 would not become Channel 10 here until about 1988. So it started as O and would become 10. Um, and I guess the other context to say is that Australia was late to get TV. So by the time 1959 rolled around, American TV networks had been going for 20 years. In the UK, the BBC had been doing their for, thing for a long time. So Australia was actually quite late to join the, the TV game. And I guess it meant for Australian TV networks, if they needed a new idea, all they needed to do was to look to America where Things had already been going for quite a few years. So 1959, TV is invented in Brisbane or, or starts. The year before that, 1958, the first telecopter was launched in America. And by telecopter, that's what the station called it. Uh, it was a flying TV studio in that it had a camera on board that could send back live pictures back to the TV studio and live to air. And so um, to get those pictures back, it actually had a, uh, a large um, rod, a microwave rod. And if you can see over here, they would deploy it under the helicopter when they needed to send pictures back. Here we go. This is Telecopter Preview. Introducing KTLA Telecopter Number One, KTLA's latest addition to its ever-expanding facilities to bring you the latest and the best in on-the-spot live television coverage. So that was a live broadcast when they first revealed this helicopter, and it actually nearly crashed at the start because they had the rod pointing on the ground, and they nearly helicopters have a very narrow center of gravity, and they nearly tipped it over right at the start, but. That was 1958, and the challenge for them was to take enormous heavy TV equipment from an engineering perspective and get it small enough that they could get it on board a, a Bell 47 helicopter. And the chief engineer of that station, his name was John De Silva. He actually won an Emmy Award in 1974 for, uh, for that engineering work, and from that day, um, TV stations all across America began getting live TV equipment. So Bell 47, first uh, media helicopter anywhere in the world. Fast forward in Brisbane. And this would be the very first media helicopter in Brisbane. This was 1977 and Channel O, which would become Channel 10 later, um, had the first helicopter. Again, a Bell 47, like that one a couple of decades earlier in America. Um, I've spoken to the crews who, who flew in this. Um, while it has the floats on the bottom, they were less about safety and more about uh, expanding the area to put advertising and, and, and signage on the, on the side. Um, it was owned by a guy who came to Channel O and said, would you like to have my helicopter based here? You can use it some of the time and I'll do charter work elsewhere. So 
On weekends, it would go off and do mustering. I spoke to one of the reporters and on Monday morning, they went out to hop in the helicopter to go somewhere and there were uh, big dings in the, um, the fuel tank. And he's, they said, what's going on here? And, and the, the pilot had hit, hit a power line on the weekend. So it was a pretty loose operation. Um, the cameraman also recalled flying up to the Sunshine Coast for a job and stopping for fuel at one of the servos on the way back on, on the Bruce Highway, landing at the servo, getting some juice and coming home. So not too long after that, Channel O realised they probably had to lift their game in terms of safety and in terms of getting a bigger aircraft. So, but that historically is the first one in, in, in Brisbane. So this is the list of aircraft Channel 10 operated over their, their history. They were the first to get into media aviation and they were also the first to exit. So in 2013, Channel 10 stopped flying um, from a, because of a they ran out of money in terms of they, they, they couldn't have the budget for helicopters anymore. But along the way, they operated more aircraft than any other station simply because one minute they were owning it, next minute they were leasing it. They lost two aircraft along the way. So there's actually quite a number of aircraft that Channel 10 operated across that time. The second to get a, um, a chopper in Brisbane was Channel 9. And um, quite interesting, the first aircraft that they tested was Victor Hotel uh, SRA. And it was the first squirrel helicopter brought to Australia uh, as a test test machine to show the Australian industry what a squirrel helicopter was like. Um, SRA, anyone know what those initials may have stood for? But why it was called that? Sir Reginald Ansett was um, what the aircraft was named after. And that chopper went around Australia demonstrating what a squirrel was like. Channel, 10, uh, Channel 9 had a look at it and based on what they saw, they eventually... E um, in 1982, purchased their own squirrel. And Bob Ward, who was the helicopter pilot there for decades, um, in every other state, all the other stations ended up going for jet ranges, but um, Bob was the first to, to cotton on to the fact that a, a squirrel would give him more power, a bigger machine, and pretty well that has become the, the machine that all the networks mostly use today. But uh, Bob's quite happy to tell me that he was decades ahead of uh, of the rest of the, the guys on the mountain. I've been up in that one. Yeah. So, um, so look, they only operated a very small number of aircraft across all these decades, a uh, very small number of aircraft. Let's jump over further down the mountain to Channel 7. And around about the same time, um, Channel 7, whenever it needed a helicopter in the late 70s, would rent one from SeaWorld. They'd pick up the phone and say, we need a chopper to go and film something. And they'd hire one out of SeaWorld. And so around about 1978, um, the owner of SeaWorld said, Wario, let's get a machine uh, and I'll base it up at Channel 7 so that they can start doing more, a lot more flying. Uh, it was Keith Williams who owned um, SeaWorld. So um, you can see it's got seven national news on here, but it's also got a SeaWorld logo. So it was a SeaWorld owned machine, but it was based at Channel 7 at Mount Cooper. The pilot from SeaWorld, uh, his name was Greg Rogers. He moved up to Brisbane and he, and he would become the first pilot and he would stay with us for, for, for decades and decades. Um, but that's, uh, so that were the first machines. And then in 1982, Seven purchased Brava Tanga Victor. Uh, it cost 350,000 US. Um, and that was the machine seen over Brisbane for decades until um, Seven also jumped on the squirrel bandwagon and, and upgraded to a larger machine. So I guess the helicopter really suited news gathering. It meant you could get anywhere very quickly, but very quickly, the helicopter also became the flagship for a news service. If you watched any news promo from the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, if you watched the opener, um, they all featured the helicopter. It was, you couldn't imagine news without the helicopter. So really it became the symbol for news gathering. Um, here's just some, some stuff I found for you.
7 National News chopper. At present, we're heading out across Moreton Bay. A beautiful day today, but a few months ago, when the lee capsized, things weren't quite so serene out here. High winds, 20-foot waves. In fact, conditions were terrible on that day. But we were there to help and to bring you the news as it happened. So, um, does anyone know the names of uh, all these machines here? Yes? Uh, the Eagle, the Bulldog, and the Dolphin. The Eagle, the Bulldog, and the Dolphin. That's what Seven called their machines. But really, um, if you didn't have a helicopter, you, you weren't seriously in the news game. So really, owning a helicopter, having a helicopter, really became um, key to, to promoting and, and gathering news in Queensland. So uh, Queensland, quite unique in that we have a mountain just west of the city and seven, nine and ten all very, very close to each other. So once they started flying, uh, they all started developing uh, helipads at their TV stations. They all built hangars. They all installed large fuel tanks so that really they were a self-sustaining operation. And if you look on Google Maps, you can see the area marked out for Channel 7's helipad. You can see Channel 9's helipad there, and you can see Channel 10's out there. So um, really, they they modified where they were to, to get used to those helicopter operations. The TV stations started here in 1959, as we learned, under a essentially a 99-year lease, which I think they paid a dollar for. So... Um, the, the TV mountain was perfect to run a helicopter from. And in other parts of Australia, all the TV stations where they may have started on a, on a hill have sold off their old real estate and moved into high-rise buildings in the city. But Brisbane's quite unique in that uh, the TV stations have all stayed on the mountain because they can't sell the land. They don't own it. Um, but it's also been very good for them to run their helicopters from up, from up on the mountain. It also meant that... Say you're in the newsroom and the chief of staff said, quick, get in the helicopter. There's a house fire at Redcliffe, for example. Um, you'd run down to the helicopter. And because we were all located so close to each other, you could actually hear whether Channel 9 had started up their machine or whether Channel 10 was going. So, um, it, you know, it was a race to gather the news, but you could hear the other machines. And conversely, um, if you heard Channel 9 starting up, it'd be like, where are they going? So we're all very close to each other in, the, in that environment up there. Mount Cutha made it for a very good home for the helicopters. There is one exception. So in 1988, Channel O, Channel 10, um, actually set up their studios down at South Bank during Expo, World, 88, World Expo 88. And they essentially relocated their entire newsroom from Mount Cutha down to Expo. And you could walk around the newsroom which was all segregated off with glass and you could peer into the control room and the studio and, and basically you got to see news in action so because of that they also relocated the helicopter down there another first for tvo and world expo the first eyewitness news chopper touchdown at the new expo helipad the expo authority constructed the four chopper landing spot especially for tvo and VIP visitors to Expo. Shari Armistead, Eyewitness News. So I reckon that's pretty well where the Brisbane sign is today. So that's where the four helipads were during Expo. So in the early 80s, the stage was set. All three stations now own their own helicopters. And um, we had our, our team of three pilots with pretty well the best job in Brisbane. Um, and... Um, you know, they, they, they had a fantastic job. On the left is Bob Ward from Channel 9. In the centre is the late Peter Clark. And on the right is uh, Greg Rogers uh, from Channel 7 and their respective machines. Anyone want to have a guess at which helipad this would be at? Um, the, the clue was that it's the Channel O machine and it's parked on the concrete. 
and everybody else is on the grass. So um, that was the Channel 10 uh, helipad. But really, any one of those helipads up there was big enough that you could get three machines in. Like it, it was a, a pretty big operation up there. What about the ABC? What about the ABC was the question. Um, the ABC in Brisbane and Queensland has never owned or had a, a, a helicopter ever. Um, they did have a helicopter in Sydney. So on very big stories, they would fly that up to Brisbane. Um, in my time, you could count it on, on, on one hand. So three, four or five times. When they did fly up from Sydney, uh, they would actually come and land at the Channel 7 helipad and, and live on our grass and, and refuel from our tank and operate from our place. That's simply because Greg, our pilot, knew Gary Ticehurst, who, who was the, the ABC pilot. Um, so occasionally for a cyclone or major story, the ABC helicopter would come up, but it would have to be very big for it to come up. I will point out very a quick anecdote because you raised it. Um, on the day that the Grantham floods happened, uh, and the disaster in the Lockyer Valley. The next day I went into work and hopped in the helicopter and we were trying to take off and fly to Grantham, which as you know, is just out in the Lockyer Valley. Uh, and there was an impenetrable wall of water in the sky out there. And that was the, the storm that was sitting above Wyvernhoe for the entire day, which flooded Brisbane. And um, there was no way we could fly in a helicopter west of the Lockyer Valley, no way in the world impossible. I actually got in a fixed wing heli uh, aircraft at Redcliffe and flew Redcliffe Kingaroy to get around it, a Gympie Kingaroy back into Dolby and then drove by car. So it took all day to get into the Lockyer Valley. The only helicopter that made it into the Lockyer Valley that day was the ABC helicopter from Sydney because it was able to come up from down south uh, where we couldn't get through the wall of water that was, was out here. Right. But that's why there's no ABC helicopter there. Um, Greg was the pilot at Channel 7. Um, he quickly got the nickname Buck, as in Buck Rogers, um, and that name stuck and still he's in everybody's phone as Buck today. And Seven really uh, developed his profile. He would be on the radio, he'd be interviewed in TV stories, he'd be in the newspaper, um, he'd even do a live cross on, on, on TV. So um, Buck became quite a, a celebrity more so than some of the reporters who, who flew in the helicopter. Um, I took these photos, most of these photos, and uh, it was great to fly with Buck. That's out on um, Morton Island, the one down the bottom. So the first cameraman on board uh, our helicopters really did live life on the edge. Um, you can see the cameraman there. Uh, he is out on the skid. Um, and one of the cameramen, his name's John Hesselwood from, from Channel 7, they were down on the Gold Coast filming and the pilot was up the front and he was playing with his radios and, and looking out the front of the aircraft. And John actually walked all the way along the skid to this point here and went on the front of the glass in front of the, in front of the pilot, knocked on the glass right there the pilot got quite a fright. It's a wonder It's a wonder that no one fell off the aircraft that day. Um, but that's what they did back in those days. And we didn't lose anybody, but um, it was a very, a very different world. So I've got a range of pictures across the time just to try and give you an idea of, of um, how it operated. So you can see cameraman here just using a normal camera. Um, then we got this thing here, which was called a Schwem gyro zoom. And obviously a helicopter can be quite bumpy. Um, so this is that device that you see there. And in a primitive way, you could zoom in on a car chase and um, instead of it being wobbly, it would take a lot of the wobbles out. The downside is it was very heavy. If you, if you wanna have a hold of that and that's, I just, yeah. And imagine, imagine if you're, holding it for an hour and a half, trained in on a, on a car, traveling around the suburbs or on a siege or something. Um, it was a very, very physical. And there's um, a battery pack extra. And, and there's a battery on the back as well. So that doesn't have the battery on it. So that gives you an idea of, of how heavy it was. Uh, and it was a bit of a beast um, to, to, to operate. Then eventually in the 2000s, um, 
we move to a much better model of big uh, cameras, um, incredible pieces of engineering mounted on the aircraft. You could sit up at 2,000 feet and zoom in on a, on a number plate, and it was perfectly smooth. And so um, that really ushered in a whole uh, new way of filming. It meant the cameramen no longer were out, out the door. Um, and if I can show you the setup today, um, this is the setup currently all the media helicopters are running. Um, you can see the cameraman in the back and he's essentially playing a video game. Um, these are his controls here and he's operating the camera, which is off the front of the, the aircraft. So he doesn't need to open the door. He's inside the aircraft and uh, what, what, he can, what he can zoom in on is, is quite incredible. So um, the technology has come a, lo a long way in, in, a, in a few decades. Functions, what did the helicopter do? What could it do? Um, aerial filming, obviously, a, a no-brainer. It was a great way of, of getting pictures. Crew transport, it was a very quick way to get cameramen and reporters anywhere in Southeast Queensland very, very quickly across to Morton Island, out to Toowoomba, anywhere you wanted it. It really sped up our ability to get to a story very, very quickly. Live broadcasts, all of a sudden you could be a story could happen at quarter to six, there'd be a, a fire in the city. You could get in the helicopter, be over the city in five minutes and doing a live broadcast 15 minutes later. So it gave us that live ability to be anywhere. Documentaries, the seven helicopter flew all the way to Cape York to do docos, all the way to Port Headland, all the way across Australia doing documentaries. Promotion, as we said, it was a promotional tool, but also, um, you know, the, the chief of staff might say, uh, go and get some shots of the, the Gold Coast and just fly along the beach at 50 feet or up and down the coast just so that everybody who was out would see us. And, and, and then they might tune in to watch the news that night. So it was a, a promotional vehicle. And then I've said other duties as required. And in the 80s, I can tell you the helicopters did a lot of things that, that you wouldn't have expected. They may have done runs to pick up seafood to bring back to the newsroom. Um, you can see here, this is the Channel 7 chopper on Morton Island, and they're um, putting fishing rods on the skids. So um, that was uh, Brownie, our fishing and coastal expert. With him is Trevor Gill, Mr. the football player. And also on that trip was the news director, the boss, and the pilot. They flew over to Morton. They'd fly along the coast. Uh, spot Taylor, keep flying until they spotted some Taylor, land about 150 metres further up the beach, get their rods out, cast out, fill the esky with Taylor, load it back on the chopper, fly further up the beach, find the next school of fish and keep going. And then they'd fly it all back to Channel 7 to the canteen and the station would have fresh seafood for lunch. This here is another colleague of mine, um, that's the chopper coming to pick him up for work. He, he lived out near um, Toowoomba. Uh, I initially lived down near Park Ridge and there were a number of times where the chief of staff would bring up and say, quick, you've got to go somewhere for a job. The chopper's on its way down and you'd go to the nearest park. You know, there was a school out the back of our place and the chopper would just land in the oval and pick me up. So um, other duties as required uh, were many and varied. Um, where would a news helicopter land? I'd say two things in the old days, anywhere where there was a story happening and anywhere we bloody well wanted. Um, and that, honestly, uh, you would go out to a story, you know, it could be a house fire at Ipswich, for example, and the chief of staff would call out over the radio and say, is there anywhere you can get down to land to go and do interviews, to get some ground shots? And honestly, you would look out and you would find a school oval, you would find a park, you would find a big a big backyard, you would find, uh, I've been to car crashes, we would land in the medium strip. Um, you can see here, landing on the road here, um, we landed pretty well anywhere we, we could find a spot to safely do it. Um, I can honestly tell you in 40 years of media helicopters in Queensland, there's never been uh, a safety incident um, with, with landings and takeoffs. And that really does just speak to um, the, the skill of the crew and the fact that we operated as a team to land somewhere safely. So if we were, I can tell you, this is a place we landed here 
um, up in the middle of nowhere, there were trees and saplings everywhere. And so when you're coming into land anywhere unfamiliar, the cameraman would already have the door open and he'd already be sitting out on the skids so he could observe under the machine at the back of the machine. And I would have the door open with my head out, looking back at the tail, and we'd be reversing into a spot. And I'd say, suggest you move one meter to the right. And the, the, the cameraman would say, yeah, and no, actually let's go back to the left. And we would honestly be nestling the tail into a spot between trees. And before we could let the um, engine slow down, I actually got out and broke off a few saplings so that when the, the rotors drooped, they wouldn't be hit. So we went into a ridiculous number of very tight spots. And I'm happy to say that uh, that was done safely throughout. Quick explanation of microwave links, because that's the way that helicopters were able to broadcast those live pictures. And it, what, it's what made a, a news helicopter um, so immediate, the fact that we could go live. So in my little scenario here, um, that's the TV station. That's a mountain. And we've got a house fire down here. And there's our camera. And so you could just send a TV truck out. And that truck, as long as it had line of sight, could beam the pictures back to the TV station. Easy. And if we put the helicopter up, it could beam its pictures back to the, down there. Let's change the scenario. Let's put the house fire on the other side of the mountain range. All of a sudden, the TV truck down here, it can't send the pictures back to the TV station because there's a mountain range in the way. So get the helicopter out send the pictures up to the helicopter and then the helicopter would beam the pictures back. So all of a sudden the helicopter, it, its function was as an intermediary to, to receive a signal and then transmit it. Why would that be useful? If you watch the 1982 Commonwealth Games with Robert D. Costella winning the, running the marathon around Brisbane, the only way you saw those pictures was because there was a camera on the back of a truck on the ground following the runners beaming pictures up to a helicopter and that helicopter beaming the pictures back to the, the TV station. And that scenario is repeated hundreds of times on whether it's a, a road race, whether it's a, a disaster. Um, we would rely on the helicopter as an intermediary link to get the pictures back. This is uh, the old Channel 7 helicopter. That's, I would sit there in the front. I would have a TV there. I would have a, that's an old satellite phone that's like bigger than a brick. And below that, I would have a panel and that would enable me to select what, what uh, audio sources I recorded, but also what video resources I send back to the TV station. Now, if you look at that panel there, I did salvage it when they got rid of that helicopter a long time ago. I'll pass it around, but you can see here we, we've got four choices of what we can send to the TV station at any one time. We could send them um, what we were receiving from, from down on the ground. We could send them what was coming out of the camera, on the, the cameraman in the back. We could send them what was coming off a videotape machine. We might have a tape that we were replaying, or we could um, send them another camera that was in the front. And then up the top is what I could select uh, for audio. I could choose to record air traffic control or the marine radio or the police radio, but you can pass around that around. It's a bit of 1982 helicopter engineering, but the microwave link was essential to enabling live pictures to get around the place. No, only fit, we could, the question is how many sources could we do feedback? Uh, analog technology could only in those days send one source back. The, the chopper, this is just a quick map to try and give you a feel for range, but all you really need to know, this first circle is 30 minutes, and that's 30 minutes from Mount Kutha. So you could get to Maruchidor, you could get to Koolangatta, or you could get to Toowoomba in 30 minutes, and obviously everywhere in, inside that was even less. So, you know, Ipswich, Logan, we're talking 10 minutes. So as soon as, as, soon as there was a story, jump in the chopper, and off you go. There were days when even um, one of my bosses had a theory that on Melbourne Cup Day, uh, when everybody was watching Melbourne Cup, that was a good time for, for banks to get knocked over and robbed. So we would actually, he would put the chopper up during Melbourne Cup races. And I remember sitting in the front watching the Melbourne Cup on the TV, just in case, you know, a big story broke. So um, 
but really, it really cut down the distance. And, and, and especially in Southeast Queensland, where we've got all these islands off, off the coast, there were so many boating stories, accidents, um, the helicopter was essential to getting around. Very interestingly, Queensland was extremely late to adopting police helicopters. Um, the Queensland Police Service trialled a jet ranger back about 1974. Uh, the, the Bell helicopter lent them for a couple of weeks uh, and it took them until like 2011 or something to actually get around to getting a helicopter. They, other states had been in helicopters for decades, but in Queensland, the service was reluctant. So by default, the media helicopters uh, actually played a really big role in that. So what no one really knows, each of the media helicopters had a police call sign and a police radio on board. So the Channel 7 helicopter was Delta 507. So we would get sent out to a police chase and you might be over, over uh, the Logan motorway filming a police chase and all of a sudden uh, the, the cars on the ground would say Channel 7 choppers in the air and five seconds later, VKR to the Channel 7 chopper, you've got the call now. And all of a sudden, the pilot would then call the chase and assist the, the cars on the ground. I'd be sitting there with the Refidex trying to work out what street they were going on to try and tell him. Um, the Refidex. <laughs> but uh, on hundreds and hundreds of stories, the fact that there was a media helicopter overhead, police or emergency services would use it. You'd go to a fire and they'd say, oh, can we throw the boss on board to have a look at the fire? You'd go to a search for a missing kid and uh, up in the mountains and the, the media helicopters would go looking. And, and many, many stories where the media helicopters actually found, found someone. So look, it worked both ways. It was a service to the community and that the helicopter was available. And it also made for a better story if all of a sudden you had a policeman on board involved in your story. But certainly um, lots and lots of... Um, chases and searches in Southeast Queensland, the media helicopters played a really big role. Just some of the other things the, store, the helicopters did. Um, Seven did Operation Eagle, where every single week they went out to a different school in Brisbane and dropped in, said good day and did a presentation. I think most of the reporters who started at Seven over the last few decades could remember the day that Frank Warwick came to their school um, and that inspired them. So. Um, I think Greg Rogers Buck went to more schools than any education minister in Queensland ever because for 40 years of his life, every, every week he went to a different school in Brisbane. Um, only once did they land at the wrong school. <laughs> Operation Eagle took Frank to countless Queensland schools in the helicopter. Thousands of children would meet the man from the news. Only once did they make a mistake. We've landed at the wrong school. <laughs> <Never mind>. <laughs> <laughs> True story. If you could single out one story from 50 years of media helicopters, this is the one story that stands out above all else as being the ultimate story that you would never have got without a helicopter uh, and that media helicopters ended up playing a crucial role. Um, I'll play the videotape and then I'll explain some more. Off Morton Island, conditions were treacherous. A sloop sailing to Maluna Bar ran into trouble when its engine failed. On board, its skipper, his partner and their two-year-old girl. Then came an enormous wave. It moved in and descended on the yacht like a sledgehammer. With the mast smashed across the deck, the skipper, who was thrown overboard, fought desperately to get back on board. He did. Not far away, the Redcliffe Coast Guard was also in trouble after an engine failed. The shark cat was caught in a trough between the crests of the waves and attempted to ride over them. Then the inevitable. A helicopter not equipped for the job tried to help. The challenge, the boat was rising and falling dramatically. With the two crewmen, Vern Butler and Colin Ward, clinging to the upturned boat, the pilot of the Wales Rescue Helicopter, Tom Ward, endeavoured to lift the men off. After several tries, there was an anxious moment as a skid touched the boat and Ward was left crutching the skid as the pilot powered his chopper back into the air. 
see action like that except in a Bruce Willis movie. Greg Rogers was flying the Seven News helicopter. The potential for a very nasty accident was there all the time, but uh, through Tom's efforts and skill, he was able to uh, save the day and uh, save the guys. The story was captured on the first video camera used in television news. What was incredible about it, to get three things happen in the one time like it did, I think is absolutely amazing. So that cameraman there was the one who was the wing walker knocking on the, um, on the front windscreen. Um, the other helicopter was the question. Um, that other helicopter was actually the Channel 10, 10 helicopter. So um, at that time, there was a machine that was leased to Channel 10, which Monday to Friday did media work, which is what it was doing that day. And on the weekends, went to the Gold Coast and was the Wales hel rescue helicopter down the Gold Coast. But on that day, it was a media helicopter. It only had a cameraman in the back. It wasn't set up as a rescue helicopter. So... Uh, Seven and nine, uh, set this channel seven and ten pilots got out there and uh saw what confronted them. And the channel 10 machine said, I'm going to have a go at doing this. And Greg said, Okay, that's fine, you do that. And obviously, seven ended up giving to channel 10 all the footage that they'd filmed because one, one of the machines was, was out there saving lives. Um, that story, that footage has been sold to you know world's wildest rescues world's craziest tv tv shows over and over and again and every time for tens of thousands of dollars us and greg and i were joking and it wouldn't be far off the truth that that original three hundred and fifty thousand dollar helicopter probably has been paid off by you know the, the the royalties from that one story um you'll still see that that footage kicking around the world on 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 rescue shows it's it's quite remarkable nothing nothing quite like it so a few other things to make mention of the 2011 floods uh notable in that all the tv stations were doing live tv coverage so we to enable that to occur and i was the reporter who was in, in the air from 5 a.m. in the morning for sunrise the entire day through to seven o'clock at night. So um, 14 hours a day live in the helicopter for a week. Now to do that, this is the only time it's happened. We had the Channel 7 Brisbane helicopter. We had the Channel 7 Sydney helicopter come up and we had the Channel 7 Melbourne helicopter come up. So it actually took three helicopters to keep me in the air, on the air, all day. Why you needed three, you needed to refuel. And while they were here, they would start running out of hours and require servicing. So there were times where we only had two of those machines online and one was up at Redcliffe getting a service. But essentially we sucked the fuel tanks at Mount Cutha dry. And then we parked out here at this, out here at, at Archerfield and we refueled here. There was still plenty of fuel here. Uh, I remember being in this terminal in the flood over here, and there was a pilot and crew from a mob called Near Map, which I'd never heard of before. And they were aerial photographers, and they'd flown in to photograph uh, Brisbane in flood. And if you look at the Near Map photos from there, you'll see me walking between here and the helicopter running over here to go to the loo, um, and our helicopters over here. So it was captured. But um, so. But there's more. We have the seven Brisbane, seven Melbourne, and seven Sydney helicopters doing live coverage. Seven hired one more helicopter just to move crews around Southeast Queensland. Today, tonight, which was the current affairs show, said, well, we need a helicopter to get our people around. And then TV New Zealand, who is our New Zealand affiliates, they flew in and they said, we need a, we need a helicopter. So all of a sudden we had we went from having one helicopter at Channel 7 Brisbane to having six there for the week. So we could comfortably fit two on the helicopter pad and we moved all the cars out of the two decks of the rear of the Channel 7 car park. And so we had two on the pad, two on the top deck and two on the bottom deck. Six machines out of Channel 7. Nine had extra machines, 
10 had their machines going. So from a very small space at Mount Kutha, you had a lot of, lot of aircraft, but six aircraft based at Mount Kutha for that flood period. Um, I'm also a bit of a historian on floods. 1974, the only aerial footage was taken by aircraft. So the crews came out here after the, the storm passed and jumped in a Cessna. It's very hard to film from an aircraft because it's, it's moving. The 2011 floods was the helicopter flood, so many choppers. And then the 2022 flood, which I was the producer of, we were putting live drone footage to air. So from aeroplane to helicopter to drone. I'm not gonna dwell, but I think it would be remiss of me not to mention accidents or significant incidents in Southeast Queensland. In 1989, the Channel 10 helicopter was landing on Morton Island. It was late at night, it was 7.30, it was very dark and they ended up in, in, in the drink. And if you go to the Queensland Police Museum in town, um, it was the police dive squad that retrieved the helicopter and uh, the, the tail of the helicopter, the tail rotor, is at the police museum in town. In 1992, uh, Greg Buck Rogers was flying the seven helicopter. They were heading to Stradbroke Island. So they're about to go over water and there was a police chase out on the bay side uh, and the, and the um, newsroom asked them to go and um, chase the police chase. They'd had an intermittent fuel line problem, which they'd been trying to get to the bottom of. Uh, and um, all of a sudden they lost power, lost total power. Uh, Greg did an auto rotation and uh, you can see it was pretty thick scrub. Um, the rotors have chopped their way down. One sapling went up through the floor. Um, but apart from, so there's Greg Rogers there. So it really only built his images, you know, buck. There's there's the reporter and there's the cameraman there. Um, they had a couple of ripped shirts, but otherwise absolutely okay. Um, the helicopter was loaded on the back of a, a tow truck and um, taken off for repair. And uh, you can see in this Courier Mail article, um, Buck says, I'll also have to square it off with some of the Burbank locals. The Burbank Koala Protection Society wrote complaining I traumatized more than 30 koalas. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, Buck cops it cool and clean, just, just part of Buck's image. Yeah, the chopper was repaired and came back to service. So it, it, it wasn't new rotor blades, bit of cosmetic stuff, but it, it was fine. This is the, the only fatal media helicopter incident in, in Queensland. Um, significantly, uh, it took off from here. The pilot came to this airport for a meeting uh, on his own, and he was returning back to Mount Kutha, which is all of a, maybe a six minute flight. And uh, his helicopter hit Mount Kutha just behind Channel 9 at, at full speed. Um, and the investigation, if I read the report the other day, they could find no fault with the, the aircraft and it goes into some health issues and neurological issues that the pilot had had. Uh, it was a very tragic day. I remember it well. I remember the day of the funeral because uh, all of Channel 10 went to it and all of Channel 7 supplied all our news footage to Channel 10 that day so that they could go and look after their Channel 10 family. So um, that, that is a very significant incident. Um, in terms of any other operators in Southeast Queensland, was there anyone else doing any other media activity? The only other one to mention is the Australian Traffic Network. So they started operating out of here at Archerfield um, a couple of decades ago doing traffic reports out of two aircraft. One would head north, one would head south. And if you listen to the radio, they'd have a traffic reporter on board doing reports. And then in the 2000s, they moved out of aircraft into helicopters and they got Robinson R44s and they're now based at Redcliffe Airport. And they go up of a morning and contribute traffic reports into Sunrise and ra various radio stations. Um, so that's the only other media machine, but they purely do traffic morning and afternoon for a brief period. I like that photo. Um, 
uh, there was a, it was the day I did the story that the first A380 came to Brisbane. This was the first landing of an A380 in Australia. It came to Brisbane, spent a night here and got painted up in Qantas colours and then went to Sydney and Melbourne and then came back to Brisbane um, for Qantas's birthday. But um, that photo there just gives you a, a nice feel of, of scale. Um, and these are some of the images from on board that day um, showing the very first A380 coming to Brisbane. So there we were, we had three media helicopters. This photo is actually taken at Kingaroy uh, at a property called Bethany. Anyone know who lives there? Yeah. Sir Joe. So uh, as you know, Sir Joe loved to feed the chooks, which was his terminology for feeding the media. So anytime we needed to go and talk to Joe, uh, literally three helicopters would fire up from Mount Cutha, fly all the way to Bethany, land on the front lawn of Joe's property, do whatever we had to do and then fly all the way back to Brisbane. So uh, that was a fo photo I snapped. But then all, then then Channel 10 were the first to get rid of their helicopter. Um, their network ratings were, were sliding. The amount of money they had to run their news operation was reducing and our helicopter became an expense they could no longer afford. So then Channel 10 left. And then this advertisement appeared in the paper in the aviation section of the Australian. And this was our first uh, little sign that Channel 7 and Channel 9 were looking at getting rid of their helicopters and finding a company that they could contract to supply media footage. So rather than each of them having their own helicopter, there'd be one helicopter to supply the stations. So that's what happened. In each of the cities where there was a seven and a nine machine, everything changed. And the result was just one helicopter providing footage to seven and nine. And Sky News are also part of that deal. And ABC is also part of that deal. So uh, this is, there's a bit to, to, to look at this, but the Channel 7 Brisbane helicopter, which is that one there, became is now the Perth helicopter. So if you go to Perth, there's one TV helicopter that does all the stations. And that's our, that's the helicopter that used to be in Brisbane. So here it is as the seven helicopter. And then it was repainted with no branding because how can you put a seven and a nine logo on it? You, you can't. So all the, all the machines now have generic branding on them. And basically they just needed one machine in each capital city and are able to get rid of the rest. And so that's now the model that operates. In Brisbane, the Channel 9 helicopter became the Brisbane helicopter and it lives at Channel 7 now. So the only media helicopter in Brisbane is at Channel 7, but it's the old Channel 9 machine, if that makes sense. Um, I won't go through the rest of it, but really, this marked a change in how media aviation worked because no one station owned a helicopter anymore. Um, it meant reporters didn't go out in the, in, the, in the machines anymore, just the cameraman would go flying, film the pictures, send it back to all the TV stations. They would very rarely land anymore because they weren't carrying crews to jobs. They would really just go in the air. So it's, it's quite rare now for those choppers to land. They more just go out and get the pictures. And then the TV stations will send their own reporters and crews on the ground to cover those stories. So our original pilots, um, they decided that, you know, they, they'd been their own boss for, for 30 years. Why would you want to work for a company under this scenario? So that was about the time that Buck exited Channel 7. And I was really fortunate enough to go flying with Buck on his actual last ever flight ever as a pilot.
flown past this mountain a few times, Bucky. Oh, yeah. Changed a bit, Buck. Certainly has. Gosh, yeah, it's, uh, we're complete and almost to the mountain. Proper tank vector, copy you complete and uh, whereabouts are you going? Uh, to uh, Mount Coos and the other thing. Proper tank vector, thanks and uh, clear control their space. The control identification services terminate frequency changes approved. Thanks uh, for your help spot on those ones today. Thank you, Victor. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Any questions? So what's the future drones? Question was, what's the future drones? Um, yes and no. So if we were going out tomorrow to do a story on, you know, a new house at Mount Glorious, let's take the drone in the car, put the drone up and get a quick shot. That works under that scenario. But say there's a, a boating accident off Morton Island right now, a drone's not going to help us because we can't fly a drone that far. So for the immediate future, helicopters still serve a purpose to have a man crew being able to travel a long distance. In the past week, the helicopters have done some big trips up to central Queensland. There was that really bad car accident up near Gympie. There was the one involving the uh, tank. Um, yeah. So you're not going to, you can't send a drone three hours north currently. Um, so the, the helicopter is still serving a really significant role so it will still be around for a while how long i can't say but for a while i've got a question back in the days when you had the three helicopters here i dare say there was a fair bit of competition to get the job but also i dare say you all were adult enough that you worked well together how much what was the attitude yeah. basically this is, this is a really good question so um on the ground you know at the, the camera the cameraman and the reporters on the ground uh, competed heavily okay and and so you if you were out to a story my my job is to get a better story than your your story so we would you know run around playing ducks and drakes so that we could get the best story in the air that never happened because we all the pilots knew and all the crews knew that our survival in the air depended on having a good relationship with each other so here's a, here's a couple of points. Um, in all my years at seven, I never saw someone from Channel Nine walk through the newsroom. You know, a cameraman or a reporter from Nine would never come into our building because that just wouldn't happen. But every month, 
the nine pilot, the, the pilots would come to each station and have morning tea with each other once a month. They were always welcome in our stations um, and they worked together. So if you're out in a job trying to find something in Moreton Bay, you would help the other machine find what you're looking for. Um, but what you said, we actually posed the biggest safety risk to each other. And I'm going to try and demonstrate this. You might want to go to your wide shot physically. So we're at Mount Kutha. We're, there's three helicopters. Come, come and stand with me. We're, we're, so seven, nine, and 10, we're all at Mount Kutha. And there's a fire at Redcliffe. Okay, so he's, he's, he's the house fire. So I'm going to leave first. I've got out here, film the house fire here at this very spot. And I've finished. And now I'm coming back to Mount Kutha. Now you start coming. We're flying the exact same route, right? Because we're going to the exact same spot and then you're coming out as well. So the biggest danger we pose, we can sit down now, we pose was to each other because we were flying from point A to point B and then back on that same line. And if, if I was ahead of you, then we could intersect each other. So there were a couple of times where there were very close occurrences. Just uh, that, an example of it, I'll just get near your mic. Microphone. Example of that, we used helicopters quite a lot in the electricity industry. And there's a high voltage line across the New South Wales border. Uh, and it was being commissioned. And two helicopters were flying towards each other from either side of the border and almost collided mm. and wiped out our, could have wiped out our board because all the board members were on board. Um, so um all helicopter all the media helicopters ended up getting transponders so that we could see each other but to answer your question we all communicated very well because not only was there a danger there say all three of us get get to that house fire all three of us are then filming the one thing and you've seen you would have seen the footage from america many times where where news helicopters will collide so we would get there buck would say okay i'm at i'm at a thousand feet Bob, you're at 1200. So we would separate each other. And as a reporter, I would spend my entire time because the pilot and the cameraman are focused on the house fire or whatever it is. I would spend my whole time going, you know, looking for the others. Yeah, I've got channel 10. He's in my 10 o'clock. He's in my four o'clock. You would spend your entire time watching those other machines because you were in very tight proximity because you're all trying to film the one thing in one spot. But the communication and trust level between those three pilots was extremely high. And I think that's why we never had a, an incident in Brisbane. That was so good to hear. Cool. Did you ever fly in formation? Uh, yes. Yes, we would come back. I've, I've got some shots in there of a Channel 10 chopper and we're actually, I took them and we were very close. Um, so we would occasionally come back from jobs in, in close company. Yes. That was a fascinating walk down memory lane, Peter, Thank you. Uh, with all that footage. Um, I actually have experience of the um, choppers formating with me um, when I've been flying uh, various uh, events. Yep. Um, back in 1988, I had flown and competed in the around Queensland Air Race. And then I was invited to fly in the bicentennial around Australia air race. So um, now one of the stations, whether it was seven or nine, sent up, um, I was flying out of Marucci in a Bonanza and they sent up the helicopter because they wanted uh, air footage of my flying. They were already doing a story on me that was to go on today, tonight, or, mm. or whatever. And um, so I've, I've flown with um, Buck mm. and also with um, Bob. Um, and then in 1991, I flew out of Archfield here for the, uh, I'd organised and flew the Laura's Bonnie commemorative 60th anniversary commemorative flight and one of the well I'd organized that the Gold Coast City Council was 
supporting this flight and SeaWorld mm -hmm. um, because Mrs Bonnie was still alive and she lived on the Gold Coast. Um, anyway, I had um, three helicopters here. I took off. We'd been I'd been parked out here, and they'd the SeaWorld helicopter flew up, and the two news uh, choppers came in and were here. And um, anyway, when I took off um, on this flight, uh, they formated with me. Um, and then as I turned onto my heading to fly south, uh, the SeaWorld chopper stayed with me for a while. And then then he um, he peeled off to go back to SeaWorld and I headed on down south. But the interesting thing was... Um, you know, I had to slow down, like flying the Bonanza and the helicopter only did 90 knots. So for him to film, I had to virtually, you know, have every, all the flaps out and yeah, so, slow down and so on. But I must say that um, Buck and um, um, Bob, Bob yeah. were, were great pilots to, um, to work with and... Um, yeah, so um, I must dig out the video footage that I've got of those flights, but um, it was a great experience. And the other thing was the PR guy from SeaWorld, um, he was a Canadian, Chuck, and um, when I told him that, that there'd be publicity, um, he, wanted, he wanted a guarantee because he said, look, I'm... I'm putting my name on the line here to support you in this flight. And I said, oh, yes, there'll be publicity. And anyway, he hated flying, but he he came up in the SeaWorld helicopter and when he arrived here, he said, I'd only do this for you. And and then he was really surprised at the publicity um, with the TV stations mm -hmm. And Channel 2 actually um, bought the footage or had the footage from Channel 7. So it was on prime time uh, news time, the 6 o'clock news and then the 7 o'clock news. Yeah, cool. so great experience. And that prompted me, I guess the significant thing is that over from pretty well from 1980 to now, every major, any story that's happened in South East Queensland has been a helicopter hovering above it mm. one or three of them mm. and i guess the ma the major experience that lots of people in southeast queensland have had of aviation is seeing those helicopters land at their school or mm. overhead so it's just become mm. part of life in, in queensland yeah. 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 and i just want to say the lady talking about that story is janice anderson thank you janice oh thanks warwick <laughs> any other questions up the front here yes daryl can you read Yes, can you recall the F-111 wheels up landing in 2006? So in 2006, uh, there was a report of a F-111 in distress at uh, Amberley. Uh, it had a, a wheel issue and I jumped in the news car at Mount Kutha and drove out to Amberley like a crazy person uh, with my crew. Um, went through the, the process to get a pass got in and they held us in a room for about an hour or two and we're like sweating going come on we've got to get out there and then eventually they took us out to right beside the runway um the channel nine helicopter took off from mount kutha to come out and film and the boundary for amberley's aerospace is about goodna and um asked for permission to enter airspace and that was denied um, so to show you how good that lens is um, the helicopter hovered at Goodna which is you know along the Ipswich motorway and using that lens was able to film that F-111 landing uh, I was there covering it live and I saw it with my own eyes it come and do that belly landing um, and uh, that was live on Sky and on Seven. So I very much remember that day because I was staying there on the runway. It was a very good day. I'm going to show the RAF. I'm going to show the RAF film of the incident to this crowd on August the 10th. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
that could could be my story. I did the story that day, and then I went back out the next day to talk to. They allowed us to talk to the crew the, the day after. I couldn't get uh, copyright to your stories. I've got the RAF. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah. RAF filmed uh, imagery on yeah. the day. But no, that was a. Um, they were very skillful pilots. It was a very yeah. interesting day. Can I can I ask a question about some of the events? Uh, my cousin was a RAF. Um, a chaplain involved at that time and he told me that that when the aircraft lost its wheel on takeoff or something of that nature and the wheel went yeah. bounce 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 along the ground he said the thing that wasn't disclosed was that the wheel took out the the uh, the uh, airfield commander's how a car oh. or something of that nature <laughs> Is that just fiction or? It's the, it was a senior engineering officer's car, and yes, he got a new car. Yeah, but it was it, it was a second hand car. He didn't get a new car. Ah. He got a, a, a replacement <laughs> car. So my cousin wasn't telling the truth. No, that's correct. <laughs> it didn't hurt anybody that wheel, but it did demolish a car. Um, it's it's going to be the car park where you all park, actually. So you're all insured. Oh. Yeah. We're coming to the park. Oh, okay. You're right then. <laughs> Well, there are not many aerodromes in this country that got arrested lawyers, but uh, Amberley is one of them because they had the F-111s and the F-111s had tail hooks. So it was very handy to be able to use that and they didn't have cash. No, Any I'm other questions or suggestions? Just, Up the back there. Up the back there. I think the second probably the biggest advantage of the choppers uh, after the, uh, the Moreton Bay world famous footage um, that John took was the... Um, the prison escapee, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, yeah. up in Toowoomba, found up in Toowoomba, and there is footage where... Yeah, so Frank, I'll, I'll quickly tell you, tell you the story. story. It's a very, it's a good story. I don't have to play it, but um, Bogo Road Prison, we know the prison used to be down there. Um, there was a prisoner who escaped in a garbage truck. Uh, it's right out of Hollywood, right? Um, there was a garbage truck in there. Take the garbage truck, bus through the doors, uh, Harold McSweeney was the was the name of the crim, um, and he fled to Toowoomba. And in Toowoomba, he shot a police officer in the hip. News crews were there. He was lying on the ground, bleeding, um, and then he was on the run. So he's headed out to Crow's Nest, which is just north of Toowoomba. He was on a motorbike. Cops are closing in on him, and he's and he's got off the bike and he's hidden it in a culvert, but cops are onto him. Now, he's just shot a cop. What What do you think they're inclined? How, you know, what are they going to do if they can get him? Yeah. They're going to shoot him. So Frank Warwick hops in the, in the seven helicopter. They know this is happening because police radios back then, you could hear everything. And they flew to the spot where police were combing some bushland and they landed in an opening really close to the bushland. And Greg stayed with the, with the helicopter, Buck, and uh, the, Frank and the cameraman went looking for this bloke and filming police. So there's McSweeney in the bush. He knows if he comes out, he's dead. He's going to get shot. So he heads to the helicopter. Uh -huh. Now, this could have been, this could have been very, this could have been pretty bad for Buck. He didn't have his gun. He left that in the bush, but he surrendered to the Channel 7 pilot. And next minute, Greg comes walking down towards the command post um, and the crew suddenly realise what's going on. So Frank runs up and starts interviewing him. And it's this surrender all caught on camera of this guy surrendering to cops. Uh, it's, 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 you're right, I, it's magic TV because um, it's right on the spot, but um, it was pretty touch and go. And then Harold McSweeney went to prison. Uh, he was appearing in court in Brisbane, in the old court where there's now a hotel, um, the Magist Supreme Court there. He escaped from the courthouse, uh, jumped on a council bus, and they shot him on the bus. So um, quite a... Yeah, so um, that's the story of Harold McSweeney, but the link with the Channel Seven helicopter is quite. Was it? He shot fatally. Or... Shot fatally. Yeah, yeah they they didn't they weren't mucking around. No, no questions from the state, our country. Yes. 
All right. Thank you very well, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very enlightening to all of us. Cool. And, uh, and thanks, Peter, for, for having me. Thank you.